Greetings, my name is David Fluvios, and welcome to In The Margins. Today we have as our guest, Dr. Catherine Norris, who is Department Chair of Curriculum and Instruction at Howard University. Catherine, welcome to In The Margins. Thank you so very much uh, for taking some time out of your busy schedule to join us here uh, for uh, In The Margins. And you know, my first question for you, um, Dr. Norris, is uh, could you just talk a little bit about your background, um, your journey um, to Howard, and some of your professional and personal interests um, that have developed along the way. Certainly. First, thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, whenever I get an opportunity to talk about teaching or the teaching profession, I'm excited to do so because that has been my life source for so long. Um, I can tell you a little bit about my background, what brought me here to Howard University. Um, I have a strong connection to Philadelphia. I spent over 18 years teaching in Philadelphia uh, school system, public school system. Before that, I was a student and a graduate of Philadelphia public school system myself. Um, went on to become a teacher, always knew I wanted to teach. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones, I guess you can say lucky. Uh, that I knew that I wanted to teach from the day that I walked into the classroom. So I was five years old when I knew that this was the profession for me. And I've never veered from that path. Um, after teaching for Philadelphia Public School System, I spent about 14 years at Westchester University in their teaching elementary, early childhood and elementary education program. Uh, they graduate uh, probably either the largest or the second largest amount of teachers in the state of Pennsylvania. So in 2021, I made a decision and I left Westchester University just to think of doing something different. I wanted to spend more time working with black students, teachers that wanted to become uh, black students that wanted to become teachers. It was really critical for me to be center and I figured that best place for me to do that would be at Howard University. I wanted to be able to prepare to uh, uh, prepare teachers to go out into the field and to offer culturally responsive practices, especially in our high needs public school systems. And that's really what's been critical for me. And that's what I'm doing now, supporting, growing um, our teacher profession, especially during this time. So crazy right now in education. You talk about, um, of course, you know, having been a public school teacher. And I, I'm just kind of interested in the perspective um, that has given you um, as you are preparing teachers. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, some of the lessons, some of the classrooms. What, what was, uh, I, I suppose, unique about your um, teaching experience and how did that inform what you're doing now to prepare teachers? I, I was wanting to talk about that journey and how it informs your work now. Yeah, I think it was really, really critical. Working in Philadelphia, I taught at various levels. So I started off teaching the young, young kids with first grade, and then I worked my way through um, teaching middle school. I taught at the high school level. So I, I have that unique perspective that a lot of uh, teacher ed uh, prepper, uh, preparers don't have in that I taught every level in the public school system. Um, I think Philadelphia pretty much prepared me to be hands-on, to be boots on the ground with our families, with our communities, with our students. And that gives me a perspective where I can talk to our current students about what some of the challenges are. Uh, working for a large school district, you're gonna come across a whole lot of challenges. Um, I think that you're going to come across a lot of joys. And, and so I have the ability to be able to talk to them firsthand. And that's one of the things that's really critical because they want to know, okay, what were some of the things you dealt with when you were in the classroom, when you were teaching? What were some of the challenges? Uh, what was good about being a teacher? And I think that those are the things that um, make it 
really um, hands on and make me be able to be a good example for the students that are in our program. Much has been said about the um, current teacher shortage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there have been a number of um, challenges and issues. Mm -hmm. um, if we talk about public schools, um, one of the challenges has been uh, to ensure that um, the teacher ranks are as diverse as the student ranks. You know, that's one issue. Um, the other issue is with regards to, of course, the teacher shortage. You know, the question is, are we preparing uh, enough teachers? Are we supporting teachers um, financially um, and otherwise? Um, you know, what incentives are there um, to really attract the best, the best and brightest minds um, to teach our young people. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the teacher shortage. Why is there a teacher shortage? Mm -hmm. uh, and what specifically are you doing at Howard uh, with regards to um, trying to train the next generation of teachers really to fill uh, this urgent uh, an important need that we have um, in our school systems. Mm -hmm. I think those of us that are in teacher ed saw this coming, right? So a lot of people just started paying attention to it uh, around the pandemic. But those of us who are in teacher ed, we saw it coming as we saw teachers uh, begin to uh, retire at a heavy rate. Um, but then the pandemic and the racial awakening, all of that combined you know, exasperated and already critical issue that we were experiencing in teaching. Uh, one of the things to me, I think one of the biggest things that we need to do when we're talking about this shortage is look at what's happening in our schools because we have really good teachers that are in our schools. How do we keep them in there, right? Because so much of the focus is on how do you recruit people into your teacher ed programs, but we're letting teachers that are already in the program leave the feel in droves because of some of the issues that they're facing in the classroom. So to me, the biggest way that you can stop this shortage is to head on deal with some of the issues that are happening in our schools. Um, and we can cite a lot of issues. Most people will say financial, the money. Most of the teachers that um, I know that are leaving are not really leaving because of money, um, even though we know that money is an issue and it needs to be addressed. Um, but I think that this is an issue that's going to require us to tackle it from all ends. This is not something where just teacher ed programs are going to be able to recruit and put these teachers into the field. We're going to have to think about, okay, what are some of the levels of problems because this is a tiered thing? What are some of the problems that are existing and how can we tackle them? at the school level, with our administration, at the community level, at the parent level, at the political level. When we think about something as simple as how we fund our schools um, and inequities that exist there that cause a lot of the problems that we're seeing in some of our higher um, need schools. So all of that has to happen and it, it's just not a one thing. And I think one of the things that we do at Howard, which I think um, is really great is that we, spend time speaking with and partnering with our superintendents and our principals. Uh, uh, Dr. January Vance does a wonderful job with uh, what we call our TIAC program. We come together twice a semester where we bring together principals and superintendents that are in the area and they talk about where's their critical need, where are their issues and what they think our teacher aid program needs to do to be able to advance the issue and move it forward. So I think that's something that needs to happen, but it needs to even probably be expanded because we need some of these political leaders that are creating legislation, that's pushing people out of the classroom. We need them to be at the table as well. And we need uh, all of us to kind of really understand what are some of those issues uh, that exist in the classroom. I'm hoping I'm answering your question as, um, I'm thinking about some of the issues that exist and how and what are we doing at Howard. One of the things that we're doing, and when you talk about this idea of the diversity issue, what is the issue with teachers and why do we need teachers to be diverse? Um, our public school population is over 56% 
students of color that are sitting in our classrooms, mm -hmm. yet we only have about 17 or 18 percent of teachers of color, even mm -hmm. less if you break it down according to demographics, black male teachers are about 2%. Mm -hmm. So there's a really mm -hmm. big imbalance of what's happening. Who, mm -hmm. who are the students in our public schools and who are the teachers that serve them? And that becomes a really critical issue. And that's where Howard steps in because we graduate um, a larger percentage of black teachers and of uh, black male teachers. And we're gonna to continue to do that. And we're hoping to grow our program um, and preparing them not just to be teachers of color in the classroom, but prepared in a way that's different than what they're gonna get their preparation at somewhere else, right? So we're preparing them to be critical. We're preparing them to have the pedagogy and to also be change agents to go into these districts, understand what the issues are and the problems are and be ready to tackle those problems head on. You know, if we go all the way up through the education pipeline, mm -hmm. a lot has been said that, you know, there is a, a issue with males with regards to educational attainment and outcomes. It's just, of course, more acute for the black male. Um, and you talk about um, black male teachers being less than 5%. I think you said 2%, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and of course, we know, especially in some of our high need and impoverished districts, you know, the black boy population um, is tremendous, tremendous. And so uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the need for that population. What is the value add? What is the benefit? What will adding more black male teachers specifically do uh, with regards to the issues that we know our black boys are facing? Yeah, um, a couple things. So first I wanna preface it by, to, by saying, I wanna make sure that we're not recruiting black males or black teachers or teachers of color um, to be saviors because that's not what we want them to be. We also wanna make sure we're not recruiting black males to just have them be disciplinarians because that's what we're seeing in some of our schools also, mm -hmm. or to have them serve as father figures. We want them in the classroom to be strong teachers because we know that there is evidence that shows that when students have teachers of color, black male teachers, uh, when they see that representation, we know that uh, academics are improved, right? Achievement is improved graduation rates go up. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that discipline uh, problems go down uh, because there are ways that our black teachers, black males are disciplined, disciplining um, that are not as harsh. They're not so fast to write up uh, the students to suspend the students or to expel students. Um, so we want them to be um, uh, role models in the classroom. We want them to be strong teachers. We want them to lead in that way, but we wanna make sure that we're sending them into districts that are prepared for them, that are protecting them, and that are not using them in ways that are detrimental uh, to their own health. Because what we're noticing, and I think there was a study done back in Philadelphia where they're noticing the rate of teachers or of black teachers that are leaving is much higher than any other population of teachers. Mm -hmm. And because what happens is um, you have teachers that are burning out faster. You have mm -hmm. teachers that are being used in different ways. So we have to make sure that they're protected. So as we recruit and as we retain, uh, we wanna also retain these teachers, but we wanna make sure that they're not being overburdened. We wanna make sure that we're not using them in ways that are not beneficial to them or to students. But definitely the, the, benefits, the benefits exist, not just for black students when they have black teachers, but also uh, for white students, for Hispanic students. Um, and the same goes when you have a uh, Hispanic or Latinx uh, teacher as well. The benefits are for all the students in the classroom. <clears throat> you know, that of course makes me think of this critical race theory issue um, yeah. that has come to the fore. Um, and, you know, for me, of course, I see it as two tracks, you know, there is the political side of it. Mm -hmm. And then there is the, you know, curriculum and instruction side of it, right? Really having an understanding of how racial constructs um, 
erected since the founding of the Republic are affected us today, right? So there is a, uh, you know, a, a curriculum instruction side and there's a political side. And sadly, um, you know, what I think that, that there's conf the confusion between the politics and the curriculum instruction, I think is, it, of course, has been, it's been really detrimental and challenging for many of us um, to wrap our heads around. You had, you mentioned the value of having more black teachers, or we'll say teachers of color, minority teachers, um, for everybody, um, white students included, right? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that need mm -hmm. um, and how that plays into the blowback that we have seen concerning critical race theory. I was wondering if you could dive into that a little bit. Yeah, I think that as long as we've had public education in this country, we've had um, people that try to block uh, education from certain populations, or we've had people who try to control what can and cannot be taught in the classroom. So this is really not new. I think that there has been an uptick of it, uh, definitely since the George Floyd, what happened when the whole George Floyd uh, situation played out and there was a racial awakening. We saw white students and white families, black families, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, everybody was coming together and everyone was demanding that our schools address race, um, uh, diversity issues, equity issues in the classroom. And you saw the hiring of these DEI, diversity um, and equity inclusion uh, people in our school systems. There was an uptick of that. And so this political movement and this legislation is a direct response to all of what was happening, right? Um, to try to stop that from happening. So this whole idea of this critical race theory issue um, where critical race theory is not taught in K-12, pre-K-12, uh, pre kind of took on the umbrella of all diversity issues. So they took critical race theory as the topic, scary topic to scare parents and to scare people into stopping the progress that we were seeing happening, right? Because there was progress. People were starting book clubs, wanting to learn more about race. We had schools that were engaging and really doing hands-on work as the result of all of these protests. And so this legislation is in direct response to that, to try to stop some of the progress. And that's what it's been doing, because now we have it put into place in some states where you can't teach anything surrounding diversity, equity, race, or anything else. Um, and so that's exactly what it was doing. So the need for us to be able to do it, we need to be able to push forward and we need to be as organized as the other side is that's attempting to stop teaching the truth in the classroom, not teaching about our history or slavery or anything that relates to race at all. Um, I think we need to be as more as just as organized as the other side is and we need to really pay attention to what's happening and recognize that it's only fear that's stopping that and that, you know, is stopping and it's an attempt to stop the progress that we've been making. Tell me again what your question was, because <laughs> I want to make sure I'm answering your question. Yeah, the other part of it was, you know, you did talk about the value mm -hmm. for everybody mm -hmm. um, to have, you know, a diverse um, teacher core. Um, it, it's not, you know, it, for, for many of us, of course, it's obvious. Those of us who are you know, African-American males like myself, right? You know, you saw a black black professor, black teacher. It's like, oh, you're, you're flocking, right? Because it's like, this is such a novelty and all the things, right? And so I think we understand that having teachers that look like you um, has a um, tremendous um, benefit in many ways in terms of educational outcomes, et cetera. Although <clears throat> the other question is, you know, for those who are not diversity champions who don't really see the urgency. You know, a teacher is a teacher. You know, there's, there's some of them I say, hey, you know, I mean, a teacher is a teacher. Um, you know, I can, you know, I can, you know, any teacher can teach anybody technically. What is the benefit, I suppose I would say, for the majority population? That's the other thing. Yes. 
to have a diverse teacher core. Why is that? A, why is that important? I just yeah. want to that a little bit. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna give you a, a quick example. So once I, when I was teaching uh, at my former university at Westchester University, which was a PWI, I had a student who came up to me after class, and she said, you know, I was her first. Uh, professor, first teacher uh, that she ever had that was a Black teacher. And what she said was it changed her opinion about Black people um, because she hadn't had experience. So she was only going by either what she heard uh, or what she saw, whether it be in the news. And it this having that experience gave her a different perspective, right? It gave her a perspective that she didn't have before. So I think that the representation matters when it's um, when you share the same uh, demographics. But when we're talking about students that are white students, um, they benefit just as much because they do. They they get an opportunity to see things differently, to take a different perspective. And if we're trying to ultimately get everyone on the same page when it comes to this equity issue, uh, that's a really critical part about it. But another thing that it does, if, if we're bringing a different perspective and we're able to see things differently because of lived experience, sometimes you have teaching that looks different in the classroom. Sometimes you have a different understanding of testing, a different way to look at um, discipline, a different way to look at um, everything in the classroom, right? So, so students are gonna benefit from that. They're gonna benefit from seeing, so if I'm sitting in a class that I have, let's say I have half white and half black students in my classroom and I'm a black teacher and when a student is misbehaving, they see a little bit more fairness or equity based or a different way to handle discipline. Um, that's gonna matter in how they then in turn take things as well. So it's from everything from curriculum. We know that teachers of color will tend to focus on uh, history a little differently. They're gonna teach, um, maybe be more apt or, or more inclined to teach um, racial uh, history or history that others might shy away from. So that's also an impact and that benefits all students. So we can look at anything along the spectrum, whether it's testing, whether it's discipline, um, it always is a benefit to have diverse views and diverse opinions about it. You know, the other question I have for you is more about the politics. You mentioned, of course, the other side and the, the other side for the purposes of this conversation probably is the anti-critical um, race theory side uh, that um, those who are interested um, in making sure that uh, we do teach young people uh, the history of this nation, which includes race and racism, and how this history impacts us now, which is really the whole point of it all, right? You know, if you ignore the history, then you'll have no idea about why you know, George Floyd and so many other, you know, issues are happening and, and why they're so uh, problematic. Um, you know, for many of us, of course, it, it, it seems essential. We have to understand our past to kind of understand our, our present. Um, but the other side of it, um, the anti-CRT um, side, there are those who do, who, who do not feel a need um, to teach this type of history, who do not feel a need um, to focus on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. From your vantage point at Howard, mm -hmm. and even down on to the teacher level, mm -hmm. you mentioned that there is a need for organization, and perhaps that's education. There's many, many things in that. I was wondering if, you know, what have you done and what can you do from your vantage point to shed some light on this issue for policymakers? Mm -hmm. um, really helping them understand the crucial need from your perspective mm -hmm. to accurately teach um, the history of race and racism and understand how that affects us now. And so you mentioned the other side, the anti CRT side is organized. Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing and what can you do to shine some light on the issues you feel 
need to be brought up in the classroom and need to be taught to have our young people as prepared as they possibly can for life in this country. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that one of the things that we can do is what we're doing now, right? Uh, we need exposure. We need to have conversations. I've written several articles um, talking about the importance of what this work is and why we need it. Um, I think the continuing to do that, I think galvanizing and maybe joining together. Um, and like I said, not only bringing together pre-K-12 but uh, in higher ed, um, but also pulling in some of the politicians and letting them see and hear firsthand exactly the work that we're doing and what it looks like. And the same thing with parents. A lot of times, uh, uh, all of this is being drummed by fear, right? And by not knowing and by not having uh, exposure to. Uh, I do some professional developments where I go into school districts, especially when I was back in Pennsylvania, and I go into these all white settings or predominantly white settings and I teach and I had always have a, a few people that will raise their hand and say, I don't think we need this. You know, why are we doing this diversity training? And by the end, typically they, they will say, wow, I, you know, now I, I see the need for it. So I think Sometimes education is what's going to be the key, right? Getting people in, getting to the parents, having these conversations. So you're always going to have people on way at the end of the spectrum that are just never going to be on board, right? We have people that are in the middle that are afraid to act or afraid to do because they don't want to be penalized. We're hearing about principals or superintendents that are being fired uh, because they are trying to teach the truth or because they are continuing with their equity programming. Um, so I think this idea of getting the masses on board is what's important and just sheerly through education whether it be conversations, whether it be articles that uh, faculty are going to be writing, professional developments that are going out into the schools, inviting some of the local uh, stakeholders or politicians in on our sessions and our conversations uh, so that they see exactly what's done. Um, I think that that's really key. And then also letting, look, taking a look at the history and how we've blocked and stopped things in the past. Because once we see that this is not new, we've done this before, we've been here before where uh, when multicultural education came out, there was a fight against not doing that. This was way uh, years ago, decades ago. So, so this is not new. Uh, what is new is um, the fact that we are seeing these districts really push against and seeing um, how it's taken off and going from state to state. I forgot how many states now have um, actual legislation that is saying that, no, we can't teach slavery. We have to take it out. No, we can't teach CRT. So, or, or we can't teach diversity and equity um, in our schools. Um, so yeah, the biggest thing that we can do is to keep doing what we're doing but to also galvanize and come together and not do working in our silos. Our biggest thing is that we're working in silos, whereas the other side is coming together and pushing forth legislation. We need to be at the table when some of this legislation is happening. We need to be at the school board meetings when they're having these conversations and making decisions about what's happening in our schools. Um, we need to also be inviting uh, politicians to come in and we need to demand that we have a say so in what it is that we're doing and what we're teaching. Teachers are prepared uh, to teach. That's what they do. We have to do a better job to make sure that the teachers that are going into the field are prepared because a lot of teachers feel that they're not ready to teach this either. So they're, so we have some teachers that are saying, okay, I don't really want to teach ready because I don't really know what to say or how to do it. So we have to make sure that as teacher ed programs, we're doing a better job at teaching our to preparing our teachers to be able to do this work as well. So it's a, it's not just a one thing that needs to happen. It's a combination of things that we have to do to make sure that we're putting a stop to all of this that's happening in our public schools or even in our private schools. I wonder if you talk about any work that you might be doing directly with policymakers, either you know, on the federal level with the Biden administration or, of course, state and local policymakers who are seemingly all involved in some way 
of course, not just with the CRT fight, but in general, um, are you having discussions, conversations, contact with federal, local, state uh, policymakers? And, um, you know, how important is that, um, that kind of dialogue, maybe directly with policymakers? I think it's really critically important. I think that currently I am not as involved as I would like to be and, and, and as I need to be, um, because like I said, I'm brand new to Howard. So I'm learning new, um, new political leaders and learning all of what's happening here in DC, which is very different from what I was doing when I was in Pennsylvania. Um, but definitely being really active is critical attending. And this is what I'm hoping that we will do. Um, begin to be more active and be more present when it comes down to the laws and what's happening. Luckily here in DC, um, our impact, we haven't had some of the impact and some of the legislation that's put into place in some of the other states, um, at least currently that has not happened. Um, so we haven't had to be boots on the ground that way, but my intention is to become more active, yes. You know, one thing that interests me was um, you using uh, picture books to teach social justice yes. in elementary classrooms. And I don't know if you could talk about why picture books um, and, you know, why is that effective and an effective way to teach social justice? Just curious. Yeah, so I'm currently um, finishing up a text uh, a textbook that will be used to prepare uh, teachers to do the same thing that I've been doing. I've been doing this for years where I do go into uh, mostly preschools, but some elementary schools, and I've even gone into middle and high school. Um, and the reason that picture books are so powerful is because one, they're easy access. Everybody has access, whether you go to the library or uh, they're not that expensive. You can get picture books easily. Um, and picture books tend to handle high um, uh, interest, high interest, the pictures draw you in, but then the content can be intense. So you can do content about death or dying with young kids in a way that they understand it, or you can talk about race in a way that is not as polarizing, a way that children could hear it and can understand and use the language. Um, so picture books are a wonderful way and they've been doing this, picture books have been doing it for years. We've been complaining that we don't have enough diversity in picture books, but now over the last 10 years, I'll say there's been an increase in multicultural children's books and they're handling topics and they handle the topics really well. So what I tell teachers when I go in for these trainings, I tell them you can start with a picture book, right? Read the, read the book to the children and let the conversation occur naturally. Because sometimes teachers will tell me, I, I don't really know what to say. I don't wanna talk about race. I don't wanna talk about, but I say, let the picture book do the work. You know, read the book and then the kids will respond to you naturally. And you can begin to have conversations because one of the things that we don't do enough of across races is talk about race. And so it becomes this thing that you can't talk about. It becomes this thing that is hush hush and we can't get to the root of the problem if we don't address it head on. And if we don't feel comfortable talking to each other across races about some of the things that are happening and picture books are a really good segue into being able to do that work. My last question for you is, you know, would you have any last word um, to the higher ed administrators? you know, task with training the next generation of teachers, but struggling um, to recruit mm -hmm. um, students, you know, who may say, listen, um, I don't see the money in this. I'm seeing all of the uh, challenges with regards to CRT. I don't want to be involved in this and even safety, right? You know, I mean, that, that's, just, that's just another um, issue as well. You know, we used to think that a school was uh, a quote unquote sacred space, but not anymore. You know, we we just seeing you know uh, tragic situations in our free society with you know people running up with guns and that kind of thing too. And so there is a struggle um, from what I can see uh, to attract top candidates um, into the teaching profession. So any last word um, to the 
many administrator, administrators who may be watching this podcast with regards to uh, what they can do mm -hmm. uh, to attract top students um, into these teaching programs so we can fill this need that is so, so vital uh, for more teachers. I think that if we're talking about um, uh, attracting teachers, I think we have to make sure that our teacher education programs are welcoming to all students. And, and a lot of times our programs are not. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, students will tend to go, especially if we're talking about students of color, they're going to tend to go uh, to places where they see themselves and where they feel comfort and where they feel uh, that they can be an integral part of a program. And a lot of times our teacher education programs are uh, spaces where there aren't very many Blacks or, or Latinos or Asians at all. So I think definitely taking a look at your teacher ed program, whether you're in, at HBCU or whether you're at PWI, a predominantly white institution, take a look at your institution, make sure that you are welcoming, make sure that your teacher education programs are, are spaces and safe spaces for all students. Um, but I also talk to, I would talk to administrators or higher ed people about Partnering with teachers, and one of the things we do at Howard University is we have what we call a community of practice, which my goal this year is to really strengthen our community of practice, meaning we're following our teachers after the, they graduate, after matriculation, and we want to make sure that we're providing support systems for them while they are in their early years teaching, because most teachers will leave the profession in the first five years. So we want to not let them go once they graduate. We want to stay connected with them and we want to find ways that we can support them past graduation. And that's one of the things that I would suggest to higher ed administrator, administrators as well. Reach down further. So create your pipeline a little earlier. Talk to the middle school students because a lot of times they don't go into teaching just because they're not encouraged to go into teaching. So let them be active and, and see what your teacher ed programs are doing create your pipelines, but then also support them past graduation as well. Make sure that your teacher ed programs are spaces that are welcoming, spaces that are inclusive, and spaces where they can see themselves. Another and final thing is make sure that the teachers that are in your teacher ed programs have that field experience component where they are going into the classroom and they're having firsthand experience while they're being supported by their university professor and while they're being supported by a mentor teacher. And a lot of times we send students into these just quote unquote ideal spaces, but then they go and the jobs are in the bigger districts and they don't have any experience of having been in those districts and done that work. So creating community spaces where they're going into diverse uh, teaching uh, during their field experience and supporting them in that so that when they finally get that job in that area, they're able to be successful and they know what to expect and what to do. Well, Dr. Norris, I thank you so thank very you. much uh, for joining us here on In the Margins. This has been an enlightening conversation. And I think that um, our viewers uh, will learn much from your perspective. Thank you again for your time. Appreciate it. Take care. Yes, thank you so much for having me.